Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel discussion on the cost of exclusion. My name is Louise Cord. I'm the Global Director for Social Development at the World Bank, and it really is my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual session. It is the first of several virtual joint events that we will have this week with the Asian Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the Inter-American Bank to commemorate the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia, commonly known as Idaho. You can follow the conversation and interact, which I hope you will, through Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram by using our hashtags Idaho2020, Breaking the Silence, and Inclusion Matters. We have a really fantastic panel with us here today, and I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing them all to you. But I'd like to start with our opening speaker, Jürgen Vergeli. Jürgen assumed the position of Vice President of Sustainable Development at the World Bank on April 1st, 2020. In this role, he oversees the work of several global practices related to sustainable development and inclusive development that bring together the best expertise across the World Bank group and partners to tackle some of the most complex challenges we're facing today in the world, as I mentioned, around inclusive growth, sustainable development, social inclusion. And my global practice resides under this vice presidency, as well as the portfolio for sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI. So it's with great pleasure that I turn it over to, to Jürgen for the opening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Luis. And also from my side, hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel discussion on the cost of exclusion. As Luis uh, has pointed out, today marks the start of our virtual commemoration of the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia, Idaho. While we all know COVID-19 can affect anyone, we know from past global health emergencies that crisis hit the poor and vulnerable groups disproportionately hard. Sexual and gender minorities are among the most marginalized groups on the planet, often facing discrimination and exclusion. And as we have noticed over the last few weeks, existing inequalities are only intensifying under COVID-19, making it more difficult for LGBTI people to access essential services they need to prevent an outbreak. Today, we honor the tremendous progress that LGBTI people have made globally in claiming rights and promoting inclusive societies. This is actually the first time that four multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the Inter-American Development are jointly hosting Idaho with a focus on SOGI inclusive research and data. And you will hear a lot more about this from our panelists in a minute. This year, the theme for Idaho B is breaking the silence. At the World Bank Group, we remain deeply committed to this cause by strengthening our evidence base and supporting client countries to foster inclusive and resilient communities. We know that SOGI-based exclusion brings with it cost to economies and to people. Unfortunately, there is very little in the way of LGBTI-specific data across development sectors. You take health, education, governance, employment, social protection, and on and on. There are data, but they are very sparse and they are not typically connected. Mostly, most of the data we have is narrowly focused on one aspect of the issue, such as HIV, in health, but not more broadly in health or education data on bullying in schools in some countries, but not in others. So it's a, it's, it's a mixed bag. And I think this is the reason why we've chosen this topic uh, for today's event. Even on the issue of violence against LGBTI people, which everyone's very familiar with, while data is collected on this in quite a lot of places, it's not collected consistently, not in the same way, not asking the same questions country to country. And so the data we have is often not comparable from place to place. In the area of economic inclusion data, the sparse data that exists in client countries indicates that sexual and gender minorities are likely overrepresented among the poor, by economic bottom 40%, and that they are at great risk of being left out of economic growth. But we need much more data than we currently have if we are to convince our governments that economic and social exclusion based on sexual orientation or gender identity is a major problem. Cost of exclusion is simply too high and something that countries cannot afford. Uh, we at the World Bank, together with our colleagues at the other MDBs, are committed to using our comparative advantage, our ability to interact with governments 
in discussing policy to help expand the evidence base on SOGI exclusion. So today's panelists will help us think about how we can use SOGI specific data and research as a tool for breaking the silence on LGBTI exclusion. It's now my pleasure to welcome and introduce the panel uh, before I hand it back to um, Luis, who will then moderate uh, the conversation and the discussion. We are very happy to welcome Mattia Romani, who is the Managing Director for Economics, Policy and Governance at the European Bank for Reconstruction of Development. Uh, welcome Lee Badgett, who is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Williams, distinct scholar at UCLA Williams Institute. And last but not least, Finn Reagan, who is research director and strategic lead at the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa and professor in educational psychology at the University of the Western Cape. So back to you, Luis, uh, and then we'll head off into the panel conversation and hopefully a really exciting a debate afterwards. Back to you, Louise. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jurgen. And again, welcome to everyone who's joined in the last few minutes. I will have interventions of about five minutes from each of our three distinguished panelists, and then I'll get to ask the first question, but we're really hoping to hear from you, the audience, on our various hashtags, uh, Idaho 2020, Breaking the Silence, and Inclusion Matters. So please stream the questions into us. And right now, let me turn the floor over to Mattia. Thank you, uh, Louise and uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's really an honor to, to be here, and I shouldn't really be opening this uh, set of panels because we have uh, phenomenal scholars on this call that have been uh, an inspiration really for years in terms of understanding better this area. The angle I can bring in is the practical operational angle uh, of uh, a multilateral development bank uh, like the EBRD. We're very happy to be involved in the Idaho commemoration. This year is very special. It's 30 years, I think, since 1990. Um, the World Health Organization in 1990 decided to declassify homosexuality as a mental disorder. So it's a particularly important anniversary. Since then, yes, 50 more countries have decriminalized homosexuality. Some 30 or so countries have uh, I introduced full legal recognition of same-sex marriage, of civil partnership. Um, 60 countries around the world have now banned discrimination of on the grounds of sexual orientation in the workplace. And yet, um, data from the International Lesbian and Gay Association reveals that actually we are seeing a visible backslide on laws and policies that ensure LGBTI equality and human rights. And this is very worrying. In our own countries, as you know, the European Bank for Reconstruction and, and Development works traditionally in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Central Asia, and most recently in North Africa and uh, the Levant, the near Middle East. Uh, in our own countries, the situation has not always moved in the right direction. Countries very close to the European Union, such as Serbia or Kosovo, decided not to renew the equality action plans recently, and across our countries of operations, LGBTI people uh, face severe and various forms of discrimination in employment and entrepreneurship. We also find, and that's not surprising, that the public opinion on sexual minorities in these countries is overwhelmingly negative. Our own data from our own um, uh, surveys are make for sobering uh, reading. More than half of the individual we surveyed in our life in transition survey across our countries of operation state that we prefer not to have a gay or lesbian neighbor. More than 40% of the people surveyed say that their city is not a good place for gay and lesbian people to live. Why is this important for us? Because our mandate at EBRD is to foster the creation of strong, sustainable market economies. And we define that very carefully. We want these economies to have a number of characteristics that we believe make markets work for people. And one of these key characteristics is for markets to be inclusive, not to leave people behind. And we do this because we know that the cost of exclusion, and I'm really curious to hear more from my colleagues about that, is a commanding indicator of the existing gaps towards LGBTI inclusions. These um, costs are across a number of dimensions. Skills and employment, 
individuals pay penalties in employment and labor earnings. We know that from the data. Across finance and entrepreneurship, where being uh, of a sexual minority and not, for example, being able to have legally recognized same-sex uh, marriages, complicate issues such as property inheritance, health insurance, pension coverage, which matters for small entrepreneurs that have to build their businesses on the back of the personal wealth. And across access to services, where LGBTI groups face discrimination in the housing market, we know that homelessness in our countries of operations is prevalent among, L among LGBTI youth, and safety on the streets and while using public transport is a major concern and, in fact, an obstacle to access jobs. So for us, and a as a multilateral development uh, bank, to build a common understanding of these issues and to bring them straight at the core of our operations is an absolute priority. So I'm very happy that for the first time we joined commemorating Ida Hot in, as a building block towards MDBs really speaking with one voice to draw attention on this topic, particularly in their operation uh, operational elements and when they speak to governments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mattia. Um, great to hear the commitment of EBRD and sobering some of the statistics. Let's turn to Lee. Great, thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, it's, uh, I agree, it's a very appropriate moment for us to look at these questions about uh, the existence of homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, and especially how it hurts LGBT people. And as you've heard already, it's really, it's crucial to understand how that treatment also hurts everyone. So I want to talk just uh, very briefly about how much our economies are losing because of how we treat LGBT people. And it's not a simple question. Uh, and we do have issues with data, as we'll be talking about today. But fortunately, uh, the data that we have available is growing rapidly in countries on every continent. Uh, activist groups, researchers uh, in academia, the multilateral development banks are, are all adding to that, uh, to that body of knowledge. And they're helpful for understanding what the cost is. And, so there's plenty of data, I will say, to fill a book. Um, and uh, I've written a book that's coming out tomorrow exactly on this topic, The Economic Case for LGBT Equality. So let me just sketch this out uh, about how economies lose some of their talent, their skills, the potential contributions of LGBT people, and uh, how that all adds up. So let's start with education. It's a crucial source of skills. We all know economies grow and are more productive when people get more schooling. And uh, the problem is that um, LGBT students learn at school also that they can be targets of bullying, they can be targets of discrimination by their fellow students or even their teachers. Uh, and this is something that we see all over the world. Um, UNESCO found data from 94 countries uh, on every continent, uh, so a, a big chunk of, of countries uh, that shows high levels of bullying against LGBT students. And in many of those countries, we know that, uh, that bullying leads to lower grades, students will skip school, they may drop out, and they may not continue their schooling. So in the context of education, homophobia and biphobia and transphobia is, are barriers to both the quality and the quantity of education. Let's think about employment. In every country, we see that LGBT people run into discrimination in the workplace, every country that's been studied, and the evidence base is pretty broad. Uh, there are many surveys of LGBT people where they report they've had these experiences. In some countries where we have data that we can compare earnings of LGBT people to those of, uh, of heterosexual people, we find, for example, that there are lower wages for gay and bisexual men in every country that have been, that's been studied. On average, about 11% lower earnings than for heterosexual men with the same qualifications. Experiments. So the job applicants are less likely to get interviews if their resume says somehow that they may be gay or lesbian or transgender. And what happens when people face this kind of discrimination? Uh, we know it's a standard feature of, of, in economics to, to know that this is holding people back from using their full abilities. They're not able to fully participate in the labor market. They're less productive and our economies are uh, poorer for that. Um, and then finally, uh, the other pillar, I think, of this argument, the big one is that uh, both experiencing discrimination and, and maybe even learning to expect it has health effects. Stigma literally makes people sick. Health researchers call it minority stress, and we now have a wide range of, of research from many countries, again, 
that find that LGBT people have higher rates of suicide attempts, of depression and anxiety, substance use, use uh, experiences of violence, and finally discrimination in healthcare settings. Um, and we actually are starting to see that uh, countries or states or provinces, in other words, places that have more inclusive policies, actually though, have lower health disparities. So there are things that we can do about some of these differences. When we uh, think about how we put that together to know what the overall effect is on our economies, um, I'll just say that businesses um, have seen this. I'm not gonna talk about the private sector evidence right now, um, but we can also think about adding it up for larger, uh, a larger view of what happens to our, our country's economies. Um, so to start, there are lots of studies, several studies that have shown that countries that are more inclusive have higher GDP per capita. That's a correlation that's very strong across many different countries and many different regions. We can also take all of those sources of, of um, discrimination in those different contacts, health, uh, education, and employment, and, and, and put some dollar values associated with that. Uh, we've done that. I've done that in India with the World Bank. Uh, uh, other people have done it in the Philippines, Kenya, and South Africa. And Consistently, we see that around 1% of the country's GDP is lost. That's a very common point in the ranges of these estimates. 1% sounds like a small number. It's not a small number at the global level, though. If we lost 1% uh, of our GDP, uh, we would be thinking about uh, a recession. At the global level, if we lost 1% of our GDP, we'd lose the entire economy of Turkey or of the Netherlands. So this is a, it's a meaningful, it's a meaningful loss in our, in our global ability to, to produce. So I'll just say that that's the, that's the, when we come to thinking about data, that's really the glass half full side. Uh, what I've talked about in the book about what exists and it's good for understanding what's happening within countries. As you're gonna said though, if we wanna compare across countries, we really need, we really need better data that come from, uh, that will come from probability-based samples or random samples of LGBT people. And just to kind of give you an example, uh, several of us have worked on the LGBTI inclusion index uh, with UNDP and the World Bank to try to measure how inclusive countries are. And part of that is we want to measure how well LGBTI people are actually doing in those countries and the lived experience uh, of those individuals. Um, and that's very hard. And let me just say, no country has, uh, has the data to do that right now. Uh, in one of the better case scenarios, which would be my own country, the United States, we've worked for decades to get better data and questions on surveys. And even then, uh, we cannot get all of those data points. Uh, we can get about 70% of them, for, of the data points on the lived experience for LGBTI people, uh, for just for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. We can have a handful for transgender people and none for intersex people. So every country has a lot of work to do when it comes to thinking about the data that will help us better understand and hopefully end the, the exclusion of LGBT people. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. And what, uh, so again, estimate of 1% of global GDP loss to uh, discrimination in labor and the loss of human capital that we're seeing with this discrimination. Thanks. Let us turn to Finn um, for the final set of opening remarks. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I'm just um, uploading or sharing some slides here as I move through this. Um, the Human Sciences Research Council is one of South Africa's nine statutory research councils, and we have a mandate in terms of knowledge production and developing evidence base for nation building here in South Africa and across the region. Um, I lead our work on intersection on identity and belonging, which takes an intersectional critical social justice approach to um, issues of diversity, uh, class, race, disability, and sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, and our teams working across Eastern and Southern Africa uh, work from an interdisciplinary and an intersectoral approach in terms of data collection across the region. Our work broadly aligns with sustainable development goals, uh, sustainable development uh, goal number one, uh, particularly in relation to reducing poverty. 
both in relation to three, four, and five in terms of access to health care, access to, to quality education, and gender mainstreaming, uh, sustainable development goal eight in terms of access to employment and economic growth, and importantly, sustainable development goal 17 in terms of partnerships in attaining the, the, the goals. Um, our work and our projects across the region and those of our partners address the underlying structural drivers of marginalization and exclusion of sexual and gender minorities, those socio-cultural economic drivers of exclusion. We feel that that is important uh, in terms of developing robust evidence-based policy making at a national level in South Africa and across Eastern and Southern Africa. But not only in terms of the policy making, but also in terms of advocacy and processes for social change, that that is also an evidence based or evidence supported process. So what does that mean? That means that projects are rolled out in relation to for example, religion and faith, uh, given that religious and faith communities are central in terms of determining social attitudes and the inclusion and engagement with diversity, including sexual and gender diversity across Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, we've also rolled out national surveys on public attitudes towards uh, diversity, including sexual and gender diversity. Uh, in our most recent iteration, for example, in South Africa, we found that there was a substantially increased level of support for marriage equality, which was introduced in 2006. And that, interestingly, over half of people in South Africa uh, believe that sexual minorities should be part of their traditions and their cultures. In terms of employment, um, I was part of one of the first studies, we believe, on the continent, um, looking specifically at issues of access to employment and experiences of sexual and gender minorities in employment, which subsequently, subsequently became an international labour organisation, an ILO working paper. That then went on to be part of and to inform some of the dialogue at a pan-African level in terms of developing guidelines, inclusive workplace guidelines across the continent. We also work with provincial governments and look at the factors that uh, inhibit or support um, uh, inclusion, equality, and greater employment prospects for sexual and gender minorities. Uh, colleagues have um, um, nodded and mentioned the importance of uh, uh, violence and a focus on violence because the data sets across the region region, uh, particularly when it comes to youth and schools, continue to indicate elevated levels of reported violence against young people who are different in terms of their, their gender and their sexuality. We also work, uh, we have large multi-country, multi-year projects working specifically with civil society partners in countries across Eastern and Southern Africa, as well as our national government partners and uh, supranational bodies in terms of broader sexual and reproductive health rights and supports for young people across Eastern and Southern Africa, with a particular focus, of course, on girls and on sexual and gender minority young people, and ensuring that they access the supports and the services that they require. So what have we learned from our partners, from our stakeholders, our networks, and our own research projects? One is that these partnerships are central in terms of beginning to bridge that SOGI data gap in the Eastern and Southern African context. It's important these engagements with institutions like the Southern African Development Community Satellite Secretariat in the Havana in Botswana, with the United Nations uh, colleagues and partners, with our national governments, and of course with communities and civil society organizations. Another key lesson for us has been the importance of intersectionality in that broader development agenda for the continent that I mentioned earlier on. We see this work has been centrally embedded uh, in work on issues of inclusion that address food security, infrastructure development, issues of gender mainstreaming, issues, of course, of poverty, inequality, and class. And finally, the, the centrality of dialogue cannot be underestimated when it comes to filling or plugging the SOGI data gap across the region. It's important to engage with a wide range of stakeholders, those faith communities, communities, um, government partners and supranational bodies in a, in a conversation around understandings of sexual and gender diversity and the implications for the broader development agenda. And in conclusion, I suppose to answer one of the questions that has already emerged within our, in our panel of presentations from colleagues is, in this particular context, there is little national disaggregated data um, uh, in relation to issues of sexual and gender diversity. 
Um, and that is creating a weakness in centralized, provincial, municipal and district level data collection and programming and intervention. However, we've begun uh, in the region to address some of that. Um, and we believe that it's important to have both the disaggregated data, uh, the SOGI data, as well as specific standalone SOGI uh, data collection processes to inform robust evidence-based policy making. And of course, those important processes for racial social change and inclusion for all, including sexual and gender minorities in the region. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Finn, and thanks for highlighting the both the opportunities for building up our databases on, at both the national level, but also at the local level. That's something that we care deeply about, making sure that this information gets down to the community and that it's mainstreamed in public data collection efforts as well as specific initiatives. Let me say before I open up the floor to our many guests who are listening online, I just wanted to ask each one of you uh, a quick question and again, encourage our guests to go on to the hashtags IdahoHot2020, Breaking the Silence and Inclusion Matters to pose comments and questions to our distinguished panelists. So, Timothea, let me start back at the beginning. EBRD has begun to look into the cost of exclusion based on SOGI. Could you tell us a little bit more about why this research is particularly important for, for the private sector? Uh, thank you. That's a, it's such a, a brilliant question because it really brings me to one of the things that has been a lot on my mind and I hope this panel and perhaps some of the guests that are listening can help us address. So, yes, we've been looking more and more at what is the cost at the microeconomic level. Remember, EBRD is a very strange IFI. We focus on supporting private sector companies only. Therefore, the focus of the EBRD work is the investment with that particular company. So we know a lot about how a company works. We have good access to their CEOs. We talk to them about stuff. So we started having conversations about issues of inclusion and LGBTI in particular. And we started trying to put that together with the data that we find. And we know, um, we know that the data indicate without any doubt that the micro level um, companies that exclude LGBTI risk in a way, they fail in attracting and retaining talent, they risk to limit innovation and collaboration, they're less able to anticipate the needs of all customer groups, and they miss out on a large growing global spending power of the LGBTI consumers. So we know that, and we know historically, and there's plenty of data uh, on that, uh, we know that LGBTI inclusive companies show stronger financial performance, including on their share price performance, returns on equity, market valuation, corporate finance, and so on. So this data indicates a strong correlation between inclusion of LGBTI and returns to the company. But, and by the way, this has become more and more evident, even in our own countries of operations, which, as I said, are countries that sometimes have been late on recognizing this opportunity. But even in our countries, we held a conference, um, Louise, with you guys, in fact, and in Warsaw, uh, recently in the Google campus there, where we attracted uh, a number of Polish companies and companies from the region. And that, un that understanding that something needs to be done, it's in the interest of the company is there. But here's my question, even after we, we collect this data and we have this evidence, we still have a problem really pinpointing what are, um, how do we translate this evidence into a specific business case? How would this, do we translate this evidence that the returns would be higher if you're better on the inclusion of LGBTI um, in terms of tools, benchmarks that companies can use, best practices that they can adopt. What works best? What are the what are the actions that CEOs can take that we will leverage this value uh, most? I think this is for us the most important area where we need to collect data and evidence, where we need to do deeper analysis. What is the leverage is at best, leverage is in the best and most powerful way, this uh, correlation between inclusion of LGBTI communities and uh, returns. So from my point of view, this is really the direction of travel for us where we are trying to go so that that puts us in a position when we have those conversations with the CEOs of companies in our countries of operations on the back of our investments and policy engagements with these companies to say, and these are the three, four top things that we can support you do 
to really leverage the value of your LGBTI employees and customers. Great, thank you very much. Um, and a good to point out the role of the private sector and also the private sector in collecting data to address uh, SOGI. I'd like yeah, to and if I can add one point on that, because you really point out something from my point of view, very important. When I started talking, I, I said that it's very important that MDBs talk with one voice and a stronger voice uh, to both their corporate clients and to government. What we have found is that going through the private sector helps you achieve more with governments because government will listen much more attentively if the largest companies start making noise, if the largest companies start demanding action because they want to be at the frontier because they know, they understand the value. And again, this is down to understanding what are the mechanisms that can leverage the value most. So that agenda with the private sector can unlock the agenda with government. Sorry to have come back in. No, but that's an exciting and critical point. Um, so thank you for making it. Let me turn now to, to Lee. We've heard about all sorts of data. You talked a lot about human capital data. We just heard about the importance of private sector data. And then previously with Finn, he was talking about getting um, data all the way down to the local government level and to getting administrative data as well as specific surveys. So if you were advising a client, which we do from time to time, uh, what would you advise us to tell the client to do? Where do you start to sort of close this data gap? What are the key priorities that you see as the areas of focus to get a better understanding of this cost of exclusion? Uh, that is a great and important question. I, I think where I would think about this is in the area that we really, in some ways, know the least about, and I think is something that uh, certainly in the context of development banks is going to be very important, and that's, that's understanding the low-income LGBT population, um, how much poverty is there, and what is the contribution of people's sexual orientation and gender identity to those poverty rates. And I think that's a, that's a really hard question to do. Um, with uh, you either need really big surveys uh, so that you can get a relatively small group of a small group of LGBT people to find out uh, poverty rates, um, or you need to really do the kind of uh, work that, that Finn's been talking about where you dig very deeply into to groups that you can find. But I think both are important uh, for a lot of reasons. One is that's the kind of work uh, that uh, the development banks are doing and the governments want to see their people uh, uh, be prosperous and have jobs and good livelihoods. Um, but we kind of run into global stereotypes about the affluence of gay people because the ones that people can see are the well-educated ones who are doing fairly well. Um, in the United States where we've been able to get questions on really big surveys that we found that there are, uh, there are a higher proportion of LGBT people who are poor than there are in the, the heterosexual cisgender community. So, so it's really important to be able to have that that broader perspective, and I think that's where I would that's in addition to all the stuff Mattia was talking about. I think it's another important direction to go for data. Thank you, thank you for that advice. And let me just wrap up my formal questions going to Finn. Where Finn, you've done a lot of work and you were highlighting a lot of the data collection efforts with vulnerable people in Soji in Southern Africa, but. What can we learn? What are some of the actions that this work that you've done suggests that we can take to close gaps around SOGI? Right. Thanks, Louise. Um, food, food insecurity is a, a, a pressing burning issue for many. Uh, transport being too expensive, the cost of transport to get to precarious employment, access to proper sanitation, to toilets, to clean running water, access to housing, to decent housing, and of course, extremely high levels of unemployment are all characteristics of the lives of many societies here in the region. Um, and in a moment of COVID, I believe you mentioned COVID earlier on, all of that, that cumulative uh, uh, exclusion is becoming more and more pressing, leading to real concerns about food security, among others at the moment. And so in a moment like that, that already exacerbates fault lines and, and existing inequalities that impact negatively and directly on the, the lives, the experiences and the opportunities of uh, groups across the region. Can we really afford an additional, uh, an add-on to the 1% that Lee was talking about, where we also factor in 
uh, exclusion and marginalization on the basis of gender, gender identity and sexual orientation uh, for people who are already leading lives close uh, to, to food insecurity, close to homelessness, already living lives of chronic unemployment, can we really afford an additional level of marginalization or discrimination in a context that is uh, um, developing uh, and that requires greater levels of resourcing for, for its development? Thank you. Thanks, Ben, and thanks for, for bringing in COVID, which is usually at the top of our minds, but um, it's good to put it in the context of, of SOGI discrimination and some of the additional costs that it can create right now. We have a, dis a very disciplined set of panelists, which means that we have time for questions from the audience and we have questions. So I'm excited to uh, ask a few questions to you. The first one comes from somebody in the Caribbean region where she's saying the governments do not want to have too much of a conversation about LGBTQI issues and that there are many discriminatory laws that are still in place in many countries. But um, in the Caribbean, as we know, tourism is the main source of revenue. And if we're going to get SOGI economic inclusion, we need to lift the barriers in the tourism sector. What advice would you have for um, measuring the cost of exclusion in tourism or what knowledge do you have? And what advice would you give? Would anybody like to, anybody done work in tourism would like to take this question first? or have thought about how to measure the economic cost of exclusion in this sector, which is so important in the Caribbean. I'll give you a chance. Okay, okay Lee, you'd like to go I can, I can take a quick shot at it. There, there is not a lot of in-depth work that I know of, but there are some surveys that have been done of people that do suggest that, uh, that LGBT people will try to avoid places that are seen as homophobic. Uh, and uh, because they, they want to have a nice time on their vacations, they don't want to have to worry about that. Um, and uh, although it's a smaller number of people, there, there are a lot of non-LGBT people who would also prefer to, who also say that they would uh, prefer to avoid places that are homophobic. So I think um, digging into that more would be a very good idea to understand that better. Like, what do people know? What are they looking for? Um, and are there ways to, to make uh, the tourist sector more inviting um, as a way uh, to, to try to grow local economies. So I think there, there's quite a bit more research that could be done in those areas, but there are hints that, that it is a meaningful uh, question and that it, homophobia may be holding back economies in that way too. Sure, no, hugely important in, in the Caribbean. I could see your 1% being, being impacted by, by that. Let me turn to a very important set of questions that are coming in. There's two, I'm gonna group them a little bit together, which is how to collect data in societies that have, to, you know, that what are the term was used here, illiberal societies where LGBTI may not be protected. And therefore, you know, you're talking then about administrative data, which means you have to check a box on a government form, or you have to answer a question in a survey. How do you do that? And how do you get good data in such a society? And I think I'd like to give a couple, you know, if you can give some quick responses to this, because I think it's at the core of our, our issues today. Thank you, Louise. Yes. Um, if I was to step back from that and to think about the, the broader work that's been done in this region, um, one response to that question is that the framing of the work is particularly important in contexts where there might not be a great either understanding or acceptance of some of these forms of diversity, sexual and gender diversity that we're talking about. And so the framing of the work is important, both to enable it, to facilitate it, and also in terms of buy-in and support for it and the dissemination of findings subsequently and the implementation of that, of the findings emerging from that data. Um, I can speak from this context, there are multiple ways of framing the work that can allow a range of stakeholders to begin to engage with this type of evidence base or data collection process. There's the broad rights framing, there is the focus on particular sectors in terms of access to health or access to education for all young people being an imperative uh, at a continent-wide level here. 
the broader development agenda in, in terms of addressing some of those insecurities I mentioned a few minutes ago and including this type of work in that broader development agenda. Uh, the focus on reducing poverty is something that has been flagged a number of times already today on, on, our, on our call on our, by our panellists and I think that's a, a, an argument that's hard to reject that everybody should have the opportunity to 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 move beyond poverty anti-violence is a strong way it's a strong um i think lever for engagement on on this topic we know from some of our national surveys including recent recently in malawi for example that anti-violence is a strong social and cultural norm that people reject violence regardless of who that person is that would be targeted, that violence is not okay. And then, of course, in the broader uh, mainstreaming of gender, gender equality, including a range of genders as a way to open up conversation and dialogue around this form of, of work. Thank you, Finn. Um, I'm, I think this, this is helpful, you know, the framing I agree with, but it's still in some context could be difficult. So I'd also like to hear if Lee or Mattia, because this is really an issue at the core of what this week is about, improving data collection. Any other comments on this important question from the other panelists? Lee? Uh, I would say one example that I know of does, does come from Africa. One of the studies uh, that UNESCO found uh, where uh, uh, Students, there was a study that was done in schools um, asking about the treatment and bullying against kids who were basically who were gender nonconforming. I forget the exact wording of the question, but it was uh, it was something to the effect of, you know, have have you seen bullying uh, against kids against boys because they're not acting the way boys are supposed to act or girls who are not acting the way girls are supposed to act. So that's that's one way into questions, especially in societies where it would be, you know, very unlikely that you would get such questions on surveys uh, specifically about uh, LGB and T people um, otherwise. So, so that's one way I think to address it is to kind of, as Finn was saying, to kind of broaden the framework and figure out how we can see how uh, young LGB people might also be falling into that gender nonconforming category and facing bullying because of it. Great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over also to Cliff, who is our SOGI advisor at the World Bank and who leads this agenda with us. Uh, he may, and is putting a lot of emphasis in our program on this issue of data collection to also provide some complimentary insight. Thank you, Louise. Just quickly, I would note that uh, we, we don't want to forget that there is data collection happening, but it's mostly happening at the very local level and driven by civil society organizations. And so there is, we, we still face the problem of inconsistent collection. It's not the same questions being asked between communities, much less between countries and comparability becomes an issue, et cetera. And of course we have the, 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 the important research issues of quality of the data, et cetera, but it is still a very important place where we can get information about what's going on, on the ground and at least begin a conversation with, with both uh, uh, clients, the governments, uh, as well as uh, private sector. Uh, the other thing I'll note is that even the governments in places where persecution happens, most often are willing to engage if they see it's going to affect things that they otherwise care a lot about. And that, and I look at, look, look at the HIV response. We have governments that not only criminalize based on SOGI and other factors, but they also um, uh, engage on responding to the epidemic among, for instance, men who have since sex with men, uh, MSM in the context of HIV, and sometimes trans women. Uh, and so governments can be moved if, they're, if we're able to convince them of a, a larger good and talk about the bottom line on economics. And that's what helped move the, the discussion around HIV and data collection. And this has something to say to us on SOGI and data collection, and particularly in the present moment, the issue of the intersection with COVID-19. Thanks, Steve. I'm also gonna ask you to talk about the, the earlier question, if you have a comment on what to do when governments are not, uh, data collection in context where governments are not that, well, where it's discriminated. Point blank, there's discrimination in the books. How do you get, get around that? Yeah, well, I think that the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that we have 70 countries that criminalize based on SOGI, but a lot of those countries don't actually use the law to persecute based on SOGI. Uh, 
uh, those laws need to change because it leaves an opening for blackmail and other things that make LGBTI people's lives miserable, but they uh, often don't use the law to persecute. Some countries do. And some countries that don't have necessarily bad laws persecute, but they use other grounds for doing so, a SOGI-based persecution. So I think the, the important thing is the nuance of, where, of what, the dis, what discussion is possible in various countries. The law will sometimes factor into that and sometimes won't be as important. Uh, and we have to look for the opportunities for that. And it really is about connecting it to the broader issues of, of sustainable development, of economic growth, uh, and sometimes even of fairness. There are countries that criminalize based on SOGI, and yet they actually passed laws that protect from SOGI-based discrimination in the workplace. So it really depends on the context and the, and the government you're talking to. Great, Cliff, thank you. Very, very helpful advice. Let me go back to our panelists. There's a new question that has come in or several questions that have come in around culture, which is a lot of the countries that we are talking about that, well, we have two panelists from, from one from South Africa, obviously, and one from the United States. But what about looking at Asia, where sometimes this conversation can be much more difficult to have? And the question is, do you think implementing LGBTQ inclusion and other cultural backgrounds such as Asia is more challenging? And if so, what are the challenges and how to address them? Can I give it a go at the first, uh, yes, first attempt? Because our work, our work brings us to Central Asia quite a lot, uh, as well as, of course, uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe. And these are all cultures who are having conversations about LGBTI encounters cultural obstacles. I think it is what's, what we found is very useful is to ground the conversation on economic evidence, particularly, and that's experience I have when you talk to the private sector. So this is really a conversation about managing risk. It's a conversation about exploiting opportunities. It's a conversation about making the best of your workforce. It's a combination about market segments, about exports. Um, so I was uh, tempted to come in on the tourism question because we find that clients in the tourist sector are some of the most responsive to our work and engagements on LGBTI. Why? Are they more open culturally? Do they live in a different world? No, they live exactly in the same world as all of the rest of our clients, but they recognize that for them, the opportunity is larger and the comparative advantage they can develop by creating an LGBTI friendly tourist attract attraction uh, is substantial. So the point I'm trying to make is that even in cultural context, so this is a difficult conversation, I think channeling that conversation through the opportunity for the private sector in our experience has proven to be uh, a, a good a good avenue it doesn't always work but it's certainly a good avenue to start the conversation in less if you want confrontational manner if Great. i could just um, yeah, yeah. yeah i was going to say i think um uh, Matias point is well taken. I think that this conversation is already taking place in a lot of the multinational companies. And so they're quite comfortable with it. I think in, in Asia, my own experience and traveling there and speaking there with, uh, with business people is that the, the cutting edge is really much more on, uh, the local businesses and getting them to see what they, what they may be losing. And, and they are listening to this conversation. They are, uh, thinking hard about it. And in many cases, they're now starting to, to, to change. So I think, you know, the, the, the cultural issues are often, you know, kind of, uh, the, those aren't things that, that we will be able to change directly. But, but I think using this conversation is exactly a way to kind of open up uh, maybe a new front in terms of thinking about how to change hearts and minds, uh, even in Asia. And that said, I think it's also important to not like overstate the, uh, you know, the influence of culture there. I, I can just say that, uh, you know, a big study that was done of uh, LGBTI people in China showed that people were more open to their families than they were in the workplace. Um, so, uh, so the, the things are happening with regard to uh, to to families and and making change within families. Great, thank you. I think it's it's a process. I think is what I'm hearing, and there's lots of entry points that all need to be kind of simultaneously pushed through. We just got a, another question 
which is um, there's often resistance, as we've been hearing, to the inclusion of questions when you're doing a survey related to LGBTQ issues or gender identity. So what would be the minimum set or the most important questions for a survey to be GLBTI inclusive? What would be the key sort of the first questions if you didn't have that much space and you had just a few, where would you prioritize? And Lee, you're on my screen. So, and you're, you're the, let's start with you on that. That's a great question. It, and I will say like the, the holy grail of just adding one question is a tough one because if you want to disaggregate, there are different experiences that lesbian, gay, and bisexual people have from each other. There's also different experiences that transgender people have. We're only starting to learn about intersex people. Um, but but um, looking hard at a demographic at the demographic section of surveys and thinking about how to ask a question, I think has to be done with um, you know with with cultural sensitivity. You need to know the right terms to ask. I'll give you an example. In the U.S., uh, it turns out that many people don't know what the word heterosexual means. <laughs> so when we, we crafted questions and tested them, the people who tested them learned that if you add heterosexual or straight, then, uh, then people do understand that. So you have to do some, uh, some methodological research, I think, to know about the exact wording of the question. But, but it is possible to do it. We've learned that uh, people will answer a sensitive sensitive questions like that and, and, and many countries have had that experience uh, people are willing to do it they don't stop doing surveys right away those are the things that um, survey administrators often worry about so it's definitely possible to do it but it's, it's important to, to to do it to not just use a cookie cutter approach and take the questions that that, that the uk is using or australia is using or the us is using and translate them you have to figure out what the right question is Anyone else? I think this is a great question. Anyone else like to come in on this one? Yeah, I'd love to jump in, Louise. Go ahead. Uh, I, I think the first question is not actually related to the item on the questionnaire. It's more to do with the, the previous question that was sent through in relation to cultural norms and understandings. So depending on who's developing the instrument, whether it's researchers or whether it's government policymakers, to have a conversation with them around diversity, including sexual and gender diversity, is the first, the, the starting point, uh, because we know that those understandings, beliefs and attitudes do inform what's permissible and what's not, including in research processes at a national or a transnational level. And then the second point, I think, is related specifically to the language, because we're talking about sexual and gender diversities in the plural. We had a, um, uh, you know, a question from our colleague in, in the broadly Asian context, and we know that around the world, um, sexual orientation and gender identity is constructed and understood and lived in different ways, and different words are used by different groups in different uh, cultural contexts. And I think it's important to have conversations around that and what the meaning of those different terminologies are. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make in relation to that is when thinking about items and questions, is, is it sexual diversity or is it gender diversity? For example, in the Eastern and Southern African context, often what we're talking about, broadly speaking, on this conversation today is understood primarily in gender terms. And so starting the conversation around gender diversity in terms of gender nonconformity, how gender nonconformity is understood in local communities, uh, what trans identity is understood to be, is a really strong and important entry point for having these type of conversations and for the embeddedness, therefore, in research processes subsequently. Great. Thank you, Finn. Um, Last one point for me, because I saw there's a number of questions on data and availability. So um, why uh, Lit survey, which is the life in transition surveys, the survey we run has a question on LGBTI issues. We are looking into whether to expand that list. So it's something that we're considering. And just to reiterate, all the data we collect with the life in transition survey is publicly available. So it can be used by anybody for analysis. Of course, a lot of the expansion of the life in transition survey depend, depend on funding. So of course, we, uh, to, as, we, as the colleagues at the World Bank know very well, it's a constant uh, lobbying to get more money to add questions and change surveys, which is an expensive proposition. Great, thank you. Yes, you raised a, a, a little important topic of financing these service, these surveys, which we, we are dealing with together.
I'd like to come up, a couple questions have come in and I've, I've put them all together maybe at the end as we wrap up the panel and give each of you a, a few words, a moment to say a few final closing remarks on anything that you've heard, any of the points, but also on what to do. I mean, you know, data is, is good and data is important, but there are some comments coming in. So what do we do about it and, um, and how do we act? So, and what would be priorities? So any final comments um, from, from the panelists and maybe we'll, we'll go in reverse order um, from, so Matias started. So we'll start with Finn. Do you want to start with, you know, the what? What does this data tell you in South Africa is the first thing policy reform or program that's needed? And I any think final comments? In, 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 a, in resource constrained environments, we really need to be um, ensuring that whatever funding uh, is used in an impactful way. And so that's a primary concern for us is that the data is then leveraged for uh, evidence based policy making uh, and implementation, uh, supporting um, service delivery to the most marginalized uh, local clinics. And I think that needs to be a primary concern right from the start. And so that goes back to the point I was making about cross-sectoral, cross-stakeholder engagement in the research process. This is part of a broader process of impactful research about inclusion and diversity that includes not just the local communities and sexual and gender minority communities, but also a range of stakeholders that are invested in the development of their societies and having that as central to the research process. So when it's completed and the report is out there, that that's only the start of the process in terms of making a difference. Thank you very much, Fen. Um, let's go to Lee. Yeah, just to build on Finn's point, which I think is excellent about the importance of involving civil society to understand what the important questions are. I think that that's just the first stage of, uh, of creating wider partnerships to get more data. So if we took civil society actors, if we took the businesses uh, who have an interest in data, as Mattia was, uh, was saying, if we took um, uh, the researchers who are interested in studying these issues and want better data, and if we all work together, I think uh, in many different countries, we could actually push a data agenda forward much more quickly to show how important it is and to show how possible it is and to show, you know, that we can actually do it. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Mattia, your final words. Thanks. I couldn't agree more on the need for a compact between uh, uh, international financial institutions like ours, governments, private sector, civil societies on understanding what's needed. I think that is absolutely crucial. And I would just conclude reiterating to the point that the agenda from our perspective now is really to quickly come with a set of best practices of tools that can be practically, practically used by leaders and companies to put into action that advantage to show that if they do it, they create value. I think as we, if we start being able to provide those tools to entrepreneurs, CEOs, and managers in companies across the world, and they see that this makes a difference, uh, that will make a huge impact. Great. Thank you. And, and this has been a fantastic panel and lots of questions have come in. I've tried to, to summarize them and I tried to give the, the richness of the comments from Mattia, Lynn and Finn. I just want to say real quickly in closing that this is an issue where the World Bank is completely committed to ensuring that sexual and gender minorities do not face discrimination, do not fear social, political or legal exclusion. Our commitment is a world free of poverty, and we clearly heard during this panel the importance of SOGI inclusion for a world free of poverty. Lee started by really outlining, I think very nicely, some of the human capital impacts, the labor market impacts, mental health, which is linked to both labor market engagement and human capital and overall well-being, and that this can have huge economic impacts um, and and impacts as well on poverty reduction. We know that, and that this is, I think Lee, I know it's Finn who brought in the point about COVID and that this is all particularly even more pressing and more urgent in COVID, where we know that, that certain groups are excluded from access to services and have faced a more challenging time in getting the care that they need. 
And these groups are often the ones that are traditionally excluded, such as SOGI communities and SOGI individuals. We know that in about 70 countries, we still face important discrimination and that it's difficult to always have an open dialogue and in advance this discussion. And that may raise some questions about how do you do this? How do you get the data on the table to show the cost of this inclusion, exclusion and to build an international data sets that we can benchmark? It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You need more data for better policy, better policy for more data and more openness. And where do you start? And I think what was so rich about today's discussion is you highlighted a lot of entry points of where to start. First, the need to work with the private sector, the CSOs, the local governments, the municipal governments, administrative data, special surveys, to bring in the donors and the bilaterals and the importance of a partnership. So that was one key, key theme that I heard. The other key theme is the need to have these conversations beforehand to frame it around the right, um, around the need for the economic impacts, the need for equality, the need for human rights, values that all many societies, most societies are, are about putting an emphasis on today, as well as the need to engage many stakeholders and to build a common terminology that may be country specific, but to build some better understanding of what are the terms of homosexuality, heterosexuality, as, as Lee was talking about. Um, it's clear that the way we're going to get to this world free of poverty and to a world free of LGBTI discrimination is through better data. I think um, Mattia did a great job in showing that companies will change, the private sector will change when they see the cost of exclusion. Governments will also be more open to changing their policies and developing inclusive policies when we do put the costs out there in a simple way. So what we heard, and I just wanna wrap up my final point is that despite all the challenges, we heard there is data out there. It may not be perfect. It may not be internationally comparable, but there is data out there. There are, and we need to use that data um, to develop best practice new tools for data collection, best practice tools for changing policies, and to use that to build the dialogue even further for an evidence-based approach to SOGI inclusion. So let me just say that we thank you all for, for joining us today. I hope to see many of you at the rest of our events. Um, during the week, we have a quite a, another Ida Hot event on Wednesday and on Friday. So, Stay well, um, stay safe, and thank you again all for, for joining this really absolute critical discussion on data for SOGI inclusion. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you guys, great.